What an opportunity. Today we've been focusing on a lot of subjects, very important subjects. This morning, Pastor Finley helped us to see final events leading up to the second coming of Christ. Then the next lecture, we focused on those four horsemen of Revelation, all pointing to something climactic. Beulah Land, an opportunity to be with Jesus forever. I'm glad to see every one of you here tonight. What a privilege it's been to nightly go over God's word together, especially in the book of Revelation, Daniel, and other areas of God's precious word. And I want to invite you tonight to revel in what we're going to present because this is God's world of tomorrow. An opportunity for us to see in a little glimpse what Beulah Land is going to be all about. So thank you for coming here in the great city of Indianapolis, in the Warren Performing Arts Center, those of you here, those in the balcony, those of you watching worldwide, welcome to Revelation's world of tomorrow. You know, we can ask the question, what is heaven really like? It's nice to hear Charles sing about Beulah Land. We can sometimes visualize it in our minds, but what is heaven really like? There seems to be a lot of confusion about heaven these days. You know, a variety of people interviewed were asked the question, what do you think heaven is like? Now here are some of the thoughts that people had. A teenager, well, heaven, man, that's pie in the sky, out there somewhere, unreal, man, I can't even fathom it. Well, you know, that's language that uh, many of you might use, younger ones. A middle-aged woman, grocery shopping, reported, heaven is a state of mind. It's an inner peace. It's a state of calm. Now, a successful business, businessman, he reported it in this way. Heaven is my house. It's worth $3 million. My chariot is my Lexus, and the angels are my kids. A college student. Heaven is, are you so out of touch you still believe in a fairy tale like that? An elderly couple. Well, we hope heaven is a real place. The older we get, the more we long for it. We just hope that what we were taught in our childhood is really true and accurate. So many people, so many answers, so many confusing thoughts about heaven itself. What is heaven really, really like? Where can we find valuable, valid information about heaven? Why is there so much confusion about heaven? Why are these kind of hazy, ambiguous thoughts floating around in people's minds? Where is it that we can really find the key that can unlock the definition and the mysteries of heaven? Well, why not look where millions of other people have looked? The key is not hidden. It is as close at hand as the copy of your Holy Bible. Our theme, as we've mentioned, and we mentioned it this morning, if you were here, and those of you who did not hear the two messages this morning, you must get a hold of those messages. Those will help put pieces together in the continuum of time and prophecy. But our theme, if it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it disagrees with the Bible, then it's not for me. 
Nothing can compare with the truth about heaven. And let's start in Revelation. Revelation 21, the next to the last chapter of the last book in the Bible and in the New Testament. Chapter 21, verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Each of the prophets from Genesis down to Revelation pointed men and women forward to a new heavens and a new earth. Now these prophets, they pointed forward to a new world, a world with clean air, clean water, free from crime and violence, filled with love, joy, and peace. You know, the Bible talks about a new heaven and a new earth. It talks about Eden, that's the Garden of Eden, restored. Eden made new. Now, think about what Eden was like. Crystalline, clear lakes, pure air, bright sunshine, kind of like the beautiful sunshine we had this morning here in Indianapolis. It was a marvelous day, but even better. Cloudless days. The trees bore lush, delicious fruit. Flowers perfumed the air. Their beauty was indescribable. All of nature was in harmony in the Garden of Eden. The birds and the animals didn't scatter when Adam and Eve approached them. They actually flocked to them. There was love and joy and companionship in Eden. There was no taint, not even the slightest, of sickness or suffering or disease. Now the Bible says that an intruder came into that garden. He suggested to Eve that sin would bring greater happiness than obedience to God. He's still selling that lie to you and to me today. Don't believe it. He suggested that disobedience would bring Eve greater freedom and the ability to be almost like God. Eve fell for that lie. Adam followed her lead, and our planet was plunged into rebellion. A planet in rebellion. Now the sad drama of sin brought sickness and suffering and heartache and death to our world, exactly the opposite of what Satan promised. He's still selling the same lie. Don't believe him. In every generation since Adam, the hearts of men and women have longed for the Eden life to return and to live a new world in a new world, free from pain and suffering and death on this planet that is in rebellion. Throughout the centuries, there were men and women that held fast to God himself. We discovered that in our past lecture. Throughout the centuries, there were men and women who looked beyond the present to what will be. Beulah land, as Charles sang tonight. They looked beyond time to eternity. These faithful men and women focused their eyes on a another land, another country, another kingdom. They believed that this earth was not their home. or just a passing through, as the song says. They believed that there is something better than sickness and suffering and heartache and death and disease. One of those men was a man by the name of Abraham. Abraham's vision 
was fixed on eternity. He set his sight on another world. Abraham focused his mind not on the things of time, but the things of eternity, because God was leading him. He dreamed of what would be. Let's read in Hebrews 11. Again, I think I've mentioned this in one of the lectures. The book of Hebrews is an absolutely fantastic book. You have to read that one. Go home tonight or tomorrow. Spend some time in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 11 tells something magnificent. Verse 10. For he, Abraham, waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. You see, Abraham breathed heaven's air and looked for a city whose builder and maker was God himself. The royal line of faith continued in the life of Moses. Moses, as you know, that's a magnificent story in scripture. Reread it. If you haven't read it recently, it's, it's just a thrilling way in which Moses was brought from a very challenging time, almost his life snuffed out, and then into the court of Pharaoh, but that wasn't the end. God had an even greater role for him to play. In fact, Moses' life can be divided into three sections. The first 40 years when he was in Pharaoh's court and learned everything, the next 40 years when he was in the wilderness and had to unlearn everything he had learned in the first 40 years, taught by God, and the last 40 years when he leaned on God completely to lead God's people. Now, he was a captive slave in the land of Pharaoh in Egypt, but he was destined to rule on the throne of Egypt. Moses was destined to be Pharaoh of Egypt. But the Bible says in that same chapter, Hebrews 11, read it, verse 24 to 26, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. You see, Sin has pleasure, pleasures, but it is temporary. It's short-lived. It leaves men and women broken and bruised and battered. Moses would not enjoy the pleasures of sin for even a season. And what does it say then? It goes on saying, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for he looked to the reward. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever visited Egypt. As I've mentioned to you, I grew up there. It's really my home. I, in early life, I knew nothing about any other place, basically, than the Middle East and that environment. In Cairo, there is a famous museum, the Cairo Museum. In fact, I think they have now moved to just near the pyramids of Giza in a brand new facility that they have been preparing. You can see all kinds of amazing treasures in that museum. But Moses chose the better treasure. He allowed God to lead him. Now speaking of these faithful men and women that are depicted in Hebrews 11, Verses 13 and 14 say, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say, such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. So although the promise is kind of far off, we like that 
royal line of faith depicted in Hebrews chapter 11. And by God's grace, you can add your name right in there. We're like that royal line of faith. We can embrace it. We can cherish it. We can look forward to it. The world is not our home. We're just passing through. Verse 16. But now they desire a better. That is a heavenly country. There's something beyond. We're strangers. We're pilgrims here on this earth. This is really not our home. Eternity is in view. There's something ahead that gives us hope and confidence. Heaven is on its way. Verse 16, therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. What a magnificent God you and I serve. It's unbelievable. Here we are sinners destined to eternal death unless we avail ourselves of the blood-stained grace which God gives to us. Jesus' life instead of our life and we can claim to be citizens of the heavenly kingdom. You know, God's prepared a city for all of us. It's beyond our wild wildest imaginations. Heaven, and I want you to understand this, wherever you are around the world, whatever background, whatever religion you have, heaven is a real place. It's not imaginary. It's not some fairy tale. It's not something, oh, no, these poor demented people. No, heaven is a real place. The holy city will descend. This world will be made over completely. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9. But as it is written, and that's a beautiful phrase, it is written. Jesus used that. You can use it. It is written. In fact, my wonderful colleague, Pastor Finley, for many years, was the speaker director of a special program, a television program, some of you may have viewed it, called It Is Written. Never be afraid to say to someone, it is written. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who, what? Love him. You see, imagine the deepest joy you could possibly have. Heaven's joy is greater yet, even more than what you can imagine. That's what the Bible says. It is written. Imagine a heart that is at peace and rest. Heaven's calmness has given greater peace and rest. Imagine the most wonderful fellowship possible, the most open sharing, the most honest communication with friends. You know, sometimes we're in settings where we have to be a bit guarded. We're not sure what people might think or what they're perceiving. Let me tell you, in heaven, everything will be so open, wonderful fellowship, because everyone's intent will be righteous and good. God's communication in heaven with us and with those we love will be closer and more intimate than anything you can imagine. The book of Revelation gives us a description of this amazing holy city that is absolutely breathtaking. John, the disciple, the apostle, the one who 
wrote the book of Revelation, receiving it directly from heaven, he was given a vision of the holy city coming down from heaven to planet Earth. John wrote in that next to the last chapter of the entire book of Revelation and the Bible, verse 2, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, and that's significant, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I have to tell you a little vignette. One of our very close colleagues in this revelation of hope activity surprised his wife today because in just two or three days they're going to have their 36th anniversary. And we had a very special program between this morning's program and tonight where he brought wonderful enjoyment and appreciation because of his wife and their marriage. You see, a bride is a precious and wonderful thing. We even saw a picture of Roseanne's wedding gown and her wedding day. Carmelo, the husband, was so proud, so happy, because the bride is a focal point. 36 years. Praise God for 36 years. <laughs> Pastor and Mrs. Mercado, married 36 years. I don't care whether you're starting out in marriage or whether you've had a failed marriage, but you've restarted in some way. God can make your family and your relationships so beautiful if you will connect with heaven. You see, God's church and God's city are like a bride adorned for her husband. And who prepares the city? Well, God himself prepared the city. Why does the Bible say it's prepared as a bride adorned for her husband? Well, that's because God wants you to know that he's preparing something for you that is absolutely fantastic. More beautiful, more incredible, more marvelous than you can ever imagine. That's what the Bible says. So as the holy city now descends to a remade earth, it's the most festive event in the universe. Now, the Bible describes the glories of this holy city in this way in verse 14. Now, the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, who are these 12 apostles? Well, Thomas, who doubted, Peter, who denied. Christ himself, James and John, those sons of thunder. The disciples were common, ordinary people just like you and me. You see, they're like people in society today. They had their doubts and they had their fears, these disciples, these fishermen, these tax collector, and just common, ordinary laborers. They had their weaknesses just like you and I do. But these followers of Christ were people with their faults, but their names are on the foundations of the holy city. Now, let's ask the question, why? Because God is saying to us, to you, to me, to wherever you are, if they can make it, so can we. If they can go in, you can go in all by the grace of Jesus. Heaven is not a place for a, just a few super elite 
perfect kind of people. No, heaven is a place for common sinners who are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And as they accept that robe of justifying righteousness that Christ places over them, at the same time the Holy Spirit comes into their lives and the righteousness of Christ, his sanctifying righteousness, fills our lives and helps us to become more and more like Jesus. That's the true, complete righteousness of Christ. Now the Bible continues describing the city. Verse 16. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. So there are four sides to the city. Each side has three gates. Three on the north, three on the south, three on the east, three on the west. Now, most cities in ancient times that had great walls had very few gates. In this way, they were able to keep the enemy out. Heaven's goal is to get as many people in as possible. They come from the north, the south, the east, the west. But why are there three gates on every side? Three, and Pastor Finley in his lecture today helped us to understand about the importance of the number seven, the importance of the number four. Well, what's the importance of three? This is the symbol of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All invite the redeemed sinners to come in. The Father says come, the Son says come, the Holy Spirit says come. God is saying, whoever you are, you can make it through one of those gates. God's saying, I'm not going to build a city with all walls. I'm going to build a city with gates because gates are what let people in. And God says, I want to get as many people into that holy city as possible. Praise God's name. And he measured the city with a reed. 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. This square city is 1,500 miles in circumference. Now that's a big city. Seven, 375 miles on each side. And what Jesus promised will certainly come true. In God's precious house, in the Father's house, are many mansions. He has prepared a place for you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and me, all of us. Now the book of Revelation describes the holy city as fantastically magnificent. The streets of the city are built out of pure gold. And nobody will dig up that gold. They'll just look at it and say, praise God. God is rich enough to pave the streets with gold. Verse 21. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Now that's a big pearl, let me tell you. Each individual gate was of one pearl. Why 12 gates? Why 12 pearls of such magnitude? Jesus Christ is the pearl of great price, and there is no way to get into the city except through Jesus. There's no other name by which we will be saved except the name of Jesus. Jesus alone is enough to get us through one of those 12 gates. And the Bible goes on to say, and the street of the city 
was pure gold, like transparent glass. God's so rich, so much gold, that he can pave the streets. He's so wealthy, he has never been found wanting. You may not have a lot here, but I want to tell you, God has something up in heaven that is beyond comprehension and is absolutely incredible. Soon the city, the holy city, will descend as the capital of this earth made new. And as this brilliant city descends toward earth, fire flashes down to destroy the wicked and purify the planet. The surface of the earth becomes a lake of fire. All the reminders of a sin-scarred world are swept away. Back alleys and penthouses where brutal brutality and vice festered are destroyed. But after the flames, Revelation says, a new heaven and a new earth appear. So the new Jerusalem settles down on a brand new planet. And this world bursts into life just as the Garden of Eden once did. You see, our God is all powerful. The river of life flows crystal clear. The tree of life bears an abundance of fruit. You see, my dear friends, the redeemed will find themselves on a solid earth, but it will be a new earth. That's what you and I have to look forward to. You know, that's why the New Testament calls it the blessed hope. It's something solid we can hang on to. It won't crumble under our feet. The hope inspires our hearts and lifts our visions upward. You see, the new earth will contain the Garden of Eden restored. The prophet Isaiah gives us just a little glimpse of this. Isaiah 35 verse 1, the wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Songs of rejoicing, songs of gladness. The earth will be made over again like the Garden of Eden, carpeted with living green. Scenery will be absolutely fantastic. The beauty will be unimaginable. The flowers and the trees and the plants will perfume the air with life-giving fragrance. You know, during the springtime, many times, I think you're even tempted, when you see a blossoming tree, you're tempted to go over and just to smell the fragrance. In heaven, it will be a thousand times better. The new earth, Eden, will be restored. Imagine opening your eyes, and it's a great new world. God's world. Imagine breathing in air, and it's God's air, pure air, drinking water, and it's fresh from the fountain of life. My wife and I live in the semi-country. We have a well. I want to tell you we're spoiled because our well water is so pure and so clean. When we come to another place where they have to add chlorine, which they do, or when it's not as pure, we can tell it. But I want to tell you, in heaven, the water will be a thousand times better than even our dear poor little well. You see, imagine eating fruit. And this fruit will be from the tree of life. Nancy and I have a, a little argument. She thinks most of the fruit on the tree of life will be mangoes. <laughs> now, I love mangoes, but a few of you, and there won't be too many of you, but a few of you will know that there is an unusual fruit in Asia Pacific area called durian. 
And I claim that at least one of the fruits will be durian, because I love durian. My wife doesn't really like it. I don't care what it will be. It will be beyond your wildest imagination, the succulent taste of everything that will be on the tree of life. You'll be living in an atmosphere of incredible love. But maybe you've wondered, well, what kind of bodies will we have in the restored Eden? What is, what, what's our physical condition going to be like? You know, some people have the idea that, well, you know, the redeemed are just spirit beings and we're just kind of like cosmic vapors and we won't really have physical bodies. But that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So let's see what the Bible says. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Now, when Jesus Christ was resurrected, did he have a body? Yes. Well, what kind of body was it? It was a glorious, resurrected, immortal body. Jesus ate in his resurrected body, didn't he? There are a number of experiences that Jesus had after his resurrection that reveal that he had a real, recognizable body. When Jesus met those disciples on the road to Emmaus, the Bible says Jesus kept them from recognizing him at that moment. He had a lesson to teach them. But it says that when he broke bread, their eyes were opened. They recognized Jesus by his unique mannerisms. Your friends, and by God's grace, you'll have many friends in heaven, especially if you tell them about what we've been studying about in Revelation of Hope. Tell them what's in the Bible. Tell them it is written. You can count on it. So your friends in heaven will recognize you by your unique mannerisms. On resurrection morning, Mary recognized Jesus only when he called her by name. Through the, the midst, mist of the morning, you know, it was early morning and she couldn't really, couldn't really identify Christ, but she recognized his voice. Your loved ones will recognize you by the intonation of your voice. Every one of you in this congregation and around the world, everyone is unique, and God knows you intimately. He loves you with an everlasting love. When Jesus appeared to the disciples in the upper room, they recognized him immediately. They knew his physical form. So your friends will recognize you by your physical appearance. But it'll be a sanctified, glorified, immortal appearance. In the new heavens and the new earth, God will give you a glorious, immortal body. You'll have a similar personality to the one you have right now. God wants to save you. You see, if God sent Christ to die for you, it's you that he wants. Wouldn't it be strange if Christ paid this ultimate, infinite price on the cross of Calvary for you and then totally changed your personality and your physical appearance? Well, it's your love that he wants. Through the unique strains of your personality, you will be what you would have been had the human race never fallen. God will make you into a new person, but your character and your personality and the imprint of who you are 
will remain. We will recognize each other by our unique mannerisms, voice intonations, individual personalities, but there will be no taint of sin or illness afflicting any of us. Here is God's promise for you, Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 24. And the inhabitant will not say, I am sick. The people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquity. Verses 5 and 6. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. What a glorious prediction. God will open the mouths of, of people unable to utter even a syllable now. Their tongues will be loosed so that they can sing and give God all the glory. Think of the joy in heaven. Wheelchairs are gone. Crutches are thrown away. New life flows through our veins. New life pulsates through our bodies. There's joy and happiness everywhere. Now, I'm not telling you just a big fairy tale and pie in the sky. It is going to be real. Amen. Revelation 21, verse 4. And God, one of the most, <laughs> I just have to tell you, this is one of the most assuring verses in Scripture, especially for those who are experiencing suffering and pain. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. Can you say amen? amen. You, know, you won't have to take aspirin anymore or some other pain. No, you won't need it. No more pain. For the former things have what? Passed away. Death, sorrow, pain, crying, forever gone. They're finished. This is a new heaven and a new earth. Now, the last chapter of the entire Bible, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal. You know, crystal, I'll stop for a moment. Crystal is expensive stuff. Pure crystal. In fact, you want to find whether something is really crystal or not. You can get a beautiful crystal bowl and you just click it with your finger and it'll ring. If it's just glass or something like that, it's rather duddy. But crystal will ring. Pure crystal. Yes, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. The water of life, it represents the life of God that satisfies every need. Just as nothing quenches your thirst like water, and let me tell you, thank God every time you open the tap or wherever you get your water from, thank God for water. You heard, you heard the lecture the other evening. We're made up of a huge percentage of water. Human beings use water inside and out. It's magnificent. And water is the best quencher of thirst, better than any kind of soft drink or any substitute. Use water. And that water of life represents God's wonderful way to satisfy us. God will bring us complete quenching of all of our needs. In the second verse of that chapter, it says, in the middle of its streets and on either side of the river was the tree of life which bore 12 fruits. Each tree 
yielding its fruit every month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And as we eat of that tree of life, those different fruits every month, you know, there's a special service that some of you may have received as a gift, the fruit of the month club or whatever. This one will be the eternal fruit from God himself that will satisfy beyond any imagination. And the leaves of these trees are for the healing of the nations, making people whole. Every bit of mental scarring because we're in a dysfunctional world will be healed by God himself. All the love that we fail to receive now on this earth, we will receive it in heaven. There will be no lonely people in heaven. We will be loved by God, cherished by God, embraced by God, satisfied by God. God himself will hold us close. He'll whisper in our ears and we'll be fully satisfied. The water of life, the tree of life, will satisfy our deepest ambitions and our inner needs. God will be the source of our inner strength. Isaiah 40 and verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know, sometimes here on earth, you get tired. You know, I have to admit, I get tired too. I'm not too tired when I'm preaching from the Word of God, let me tell you. It's exciting. It, 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 it enervates you. It fills you with a power, but you do get tired. Sometimes you feel a lack of energy here on this earth. Sometimes you just feel weary. I'm just tired. But God is going to give you an injection of divine energy beyond comprehension. He's going to hook you up to the divine energy machine, the tree of life. And energy will flow through your bodies. Look at how Isaiah the prophet describes life in this new earth. Isaiah 11, verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So violence is gone. War is gone. Conflict is gone. There's no strife between nations. No one is going to hurt or destroy. They're going to put down their weapons of war. Every threat of war disappears. Peace fills the earth. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of God. Heaven, heaven is a real place. Beulah land, as Charles sang, is a real place. There will be real activities, songs of praise and gladness cover the earth. Heaven is no make-believe world. Isaiah 65, verse 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. I'm glad that there are some things about this life that we'll never remember again. God gives us special spiritual amnesia for evil, the evil things that came about. Amnesia for wickedness, for sorrow, for disappointment, for pain. It's a cosmic amnesia that God gives. It says in Scripture, we'll forget about the bad things that have ever happened to us. Heaven is going to be a place with joyous memories. Isaiah 65, 21 and 22. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Now think of it. The best architects of the ages will be there. 
they'll draw the plans for your dream home at no charge. Now I have to tell you, I'm a frustrated amateur architect. My wife will tell you that. In fact, at one point in my life, I kind of thought it would be nice to be an architect. So I still harbor those inclinations. And sometimes, you know, I will take down a wall in our house or redo things and all of that. I love it. I love to do it. And my wife says, do you really know what you're doing? And I say, well, not exactly, but let's see how it turns out. Fortunately, by God's grace, it usually turns out okay. So I'm protected from the wrath of my wife. But I want to tell you, the architects of the ages will be there. All of the most outstanding building materials in the universe will be there, and they'll be at your disposal, and you won't have to pay a dime. You know, in our world right now, wood has gone up enormously in price. For you to build something will cost you something, but in heaven, everything will be available to you. Angels will even help you to build your house if you want them to. The Bible says they shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall the days of my people and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. You see, what about fellowship and friends in heaven? One of the greatest joys in heaven will be the fellowship with our friends. Now listen to this. Heaven would be pretty boring if I had my house and nobody was there, nobody else was there. Heaven would be pretty boring indeed if nobody was there to enjoy it with me. Matthew 8, verse 11. And I say to you that many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Imagine it. We're going to sit down with the great spiritual minds of the ages, God's heroes of faith. Throughout the ages are going to be there in heaven with us. The Bible, the Bible heroes of scripture that we've only read about and we've never yet met them because they died years ago. Think about it. We're going to be with them. Well, just think about it for a second. You know, you're, you're working in your garden. I'm working in my garden up in heaven. And one day I see a, a man walking down the street. And I say, whoa. Uh, that looks like, could it be, are you Adam? <laughs> yes, I'm Adam. I don't know what he sounds like, but I'm, he's a big guy. I've been admiring the large ears of corn in your garden, Adam says. Do you want one ear to feed your large family? I can spare one ear, but it'll feel, feed the whole family. Adam looks at my strawberries, and he says, I've been admiring your strawberries. Adam comes over and we, we sit down together and we begin to talk about life and the joys of being with Jesus. And then one day, I'm walking along and I meet Moses. Moses, who received the Ten Commandments written by the very finger, the very hand of God. And Moses and I talk about what it was like to go through the Red Sea and the faith that it took to walk into the water, and then those walls of water came up. We talk about what it must have been like to lead the children of Israel 40 years in the wilderness. And then I meet Daniel. And he tells me about the lion's den experience, and I say, but Daniel, weren't you afraid of being in there with those, those vicious lions? And he responds, 
I trusted God. You see, heaven is going to be a place of real fellowship. Fellowship with the angels, the cherubim, and the seraphim. Fellowship with the great minds and heroes of the Bible. Men and women of all ages. It's a place to fellowship with Peter, James, John, and Paul. But most of all, my dear friends, here in Indianapolis and around the world, wherever you're watching, heaven is a place to fellowship with Jesus. Because one day, you and I will meet Jesus, who died for us. This Christ, who had nails driven through his hands for us. This Christ, who had a crown of thorns jammed onto his forehead. This Christ, who shed his blood for you and for me. And one day, as we enter that city, Jesus will be there to welcome us, and he will say, this land is your land. This is your home. And you're never going to cry again. Well, you might cry some tears of joy, but you're never going to cry because of sadness. You're never going to feel sorrowful. You're never going to feel disappointed again. Never have heartache again. The Bible says in Isaiah 66, verse 23, from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Amen. So they'll come from the north and the south, the east and the west. Yes, they'll come from north Indianapolis and south Indianapolis and east Indianapolis and west Indianapolis, but they'll come from every point of the globe and they'll come to fellowship with Jesus on the Bible Sabbath, the Sabbath that God created. I can imagine it. We come there to that great heavenly temple, and there is an enormous chorus of praise. Today in our service, earlier today, we had two beautiful songs from different groups, one in Spanish and one in Mizo, which is in the northeast part of India. I want to tell you, we're going to have such a fantastic mass choir in heaven, it's going to thrill you to your very soul. And they're going to be singing praises to the God Almighty. The angels are going to be singing, Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive riches and honor and power and glory forever. The angels are singing. Cherubim are singing. The father gets up and he introduces his son. And Jesus, our Lord and Savior, stands up. He reaches back. And he pulls back a portion of his hair. And the scars of sin are still there. The marks of sin are the marks that are still faintly, available, uh, 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 faintly visible in his hands. The faint print of the wounds is an external reminder of his love for us and they will remain there forever. Jesus said and says at that time, because he says he loves us, but at that time he will say, I loved you so much I went to the cross just for you. Look at the beautiful flowers. They're there for you. Take a breath of this incredible fresh air it's for you Jesus says to you and to me and to everyone who avails themselves of the love and grace of God I want you to know that I want to know you and I want to live with you forever Revelation 21 verse 3 
and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. I want to stop for a moment. How many of you want to be part of his people? Praise God. Let's move on. It says here, God himself will be with them and be their God. Verse 4 of Revelation 22, they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads forever. You know, one day, let's just imagine for a moment, I'm not saying I'm getting to heaven because of anything I have done. I'm saying I'm going to get to heaven by the grace and blood of Jesus Christ. And so one day up in heaven, I'm leaving that heavenly temple and Jesus stands before me and he reaches out his hands and he says, I want to take a walk with you. And we walk through the beautiful fields of waving grain and Jesus reaches out and he just breaks off a little bit of the grain and he says, taste it. There's no grain in the world like this. I made this chemical formula for your taste buds. Do you like it? We walk over a hill and Jesus says, look at those flowers. Aren't they absolutely magnificent? There are no other flowers like them in the universe. Look at the purples and, and the reds and the blues and the pinks. There's nothing like it in the world. I made that bouquet, uh, bouquet just for you. And I painted a hillside with all these beautiful colors. And I hear a chorus of angels. And Jesus says, those angels are singing for you. You are valuable to me. You are precious to me. I would have entered into the agony and pain and suffering on the cross of Calvary if only it was you that would have been the only one to save. He puts his hand on my shoulder, on your shoulder, and he says, you know something? I don't have anybody else like you. None of the angels are like you. None of the millions of the redeemed are like you. I don't have anybody like you. You're so valuable to me. If I lost you, I couldn't replace you. He really does feel that way about you and you and you and you and you. He loves you with an everlasting friend. Christ came and heaven was poured out for each of us. God's plans for you are far more amazing than anyone can realize. God's plans for you are more exciting than anything you can conjure up in your mind this evening. One day, one day, Jesus is going to come. Amen. One day, you and I are going home, going home where we belong, going home where we sense our hearts will never roam again and will be with Christ forever. No sickness, no suffering. No death, no pain, throughout all eternity. We'll be with our friends forever. We'll be with our loved ones forever. We'll be with Jesus forever. Amen. Believing in Christ, loving Christ, serving Christ. Tonight. Are you willing to say, Jesus, I long to live with you throughout all eternity. Tonight, I want to give my life to you again. 
And if there are those who have not committed themselves to being baptized by immersion, as Jesus was, I invite you to make that decision tonight. Many have already made that decision. Many have been baptized. But the Lord is calling you tonight. He wants to have you commit your life to him. What a precious thing it is to imagine that very soon, soon and very soon, we will see the King, Jesus Christ, streaming down through the corridors of time. And then he will take us to heaven, and we will be with him for a thousand years. And then that holy city will descend to this earth. And it will be a glorious city. I want Charles to sing now that beautiful song about the new Jerusalem, about the holy city. Picture in your mind that wonderful city coming down out of heaven itself all for you where you will live throughout eternity in the presence of God himself. I also want you to think seriously about your decision to be there. Pastors, you can bring your baptismal candidates here. As we climax revelation of hope, we've been having baptism after baptism after baptism. Last night baptisms, this morning in the early service baptisms, tonight in the, in the second service this morning baptisms, in the later service today baptisms. We just praise God. Many more have made decisions for baptism. Pastor Noel, enter into the baptismal pool with your candidates. We are so thankful. You know, it's a wonderful thing for any baptism, but when I see a husband and wife into the baptismal pool. When I see a husband and wife come into the baptismal pool, I'm really especially thrilled. Bayron, Bayron and Chelsea were just married, and now they want to seal their commitment in marriage with a commitment to Jesus Christ. They've made that commitment as a young couple that they want to follow Jesus, that they want to live in harmony with Jesus. They want to have a Christian home. They want to live a godly life. So, my dear brother Byron, my dear sister Chelsea, Pastor Wilson and I and Pastor Noel, raise our hands to heaven. And we baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saved, Jesus saved. Spread the gladness all around. Jesus saved, Jesus saved. My dear brother, God has called you to be a spiritual leader in your family. God has called you to be a man of faith and a man of God. And because of your commitment to Christ, and because of your desire to follow him, and because you want to be part of God's people in these last days, we baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bear the news to every land, climb the steeps, and cross the ways. Unto this our Lord's command, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Come, my brother, my sister.
Pastor Tunde is entering the baptismal pool. And what a wonderful story this is with Brother Johnson. And I want to read to you Brother Johnson. This is what Brother Johnson wrote. And it's really a, a, quite a thrilling story when you see it. Brother Johnson says this, My first contact with the Adventist Church was through Pathway to Health in Indianapolis last month. If you're not familiar with Pathway to Health, it was held in the Lucas Oil Stadium, sponsored by the Adventist Church. We treated over 4,500 people. And this is what Brother Johnson says. He says, I knew that this must be the true church. I saw such love and kindness. When I walked into the Get Your Best Pathway, I knew this is where I belong. I've not missed a Sabbath service at Emmanuel SDA Church since Pathway ended. I've found what I've been praying for and searching all of my life. Amen, amen, amen. So Pastor, so Pastor Tunde, Pastor Wilson, we raise our hands. And my dear brother, because through your own testimony, you have found what you've been looking for all your life in Jesus Christ and a people that teaches the truth of the Bible, we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sing above the battle strife. Jesus saved, Jesus saved by his death and endless life. Jesus saved, Jesus saved. Sing it softly through the gloom when the heart of mercy crave. Sing in triumph over the tomb. Jesus saved, Jesus saves. Sometimes we drift from the God of our childhood. Sometimes life kicks us in the stomach and gives us some very difficult blows. Donald drifted for a while, but the Spirit of God never gave up on him. The Spirit of God kept convicting and bringing him back again and again and again. And Donald's testimony is this, I'm so excited to return to the God of my youth. I'm forgiven and empowered in Christ. So my dear brother, Donald, because of your commitment to Christ and your desire to follow him, and you've been forgiven. You go under the water and you're cleansed in Jesus, a new man in Christ. We baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Redeem now how I love to proclaim it. Redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Redeem, redeem, redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Help me sing it. Redeem, how I love to proclaim it, his child and forever I am. Pastor Eric Frecking enters the baptismal pool. And this is another one of those miracle stories. Brenda Gaston enters the baptismal pool with her two grandchildren, Stefan and Kiri. Now, Renda's story is quite another amazing one. Renda always has had this passion for God, this heart for God, and for many years she was searching. Some time ago, she was serving in another denomination, in another church. And something happened that day where there was this deep impression. You need to go search out Seventh-day Adventists because they have the truth. She could not shake it. She could not deny it. It was like this voice came to her and said, I have something more for you, something larger for you. I have another step for you to take. You have been serving me, but you've been faithful, and I want to lead you to something greater. This set her off on a journey to study the Bible. And as she studied the Bible on her own, she came to the decision that the Bible Sabbath was the seventh day of the week. Amen. 
as she studied, she came to the decision that Jesus was coming soon. She received a flyer in the mail for these meetings, but she was already prepared by the Holy Spirit of God to accept these truths. She's come to the meetings, and she's being baptized, and she began sharing with her grandchildren. And they said, Grandma, we want to be baptized too. And so, my dear sister, with Pastor Frecking, we lift our hands to heaven and we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I think of my blessed Redeemer. Amen. I think Amen. You've come home, my dear sister. All the day long I sing. For I cannot be silent. His love is a theme of my song. Stefan, you're a young boy, but Jesus said, Forbid not the children to come to me, for of such is the kingdom of God. And this little boy with his grandma said, I want to be baptized too. So my dear Stefan, we raise our hands to heaven and baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. When the trumpet Amen. of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair When the saved on earth shall gather over on the other shore And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there Kari, a young man who loves Jesus A young man who said, I want to follow Jesus a young man who said, Grandma, if you're going to be baptized, we want to go too. Hallelujah. What a testimony it is to Kari, but what a testimony it is too, to Brenda, who has nurtured these young men, who has shared the Bible truths with them, who's been a faithful woman of God to them. Amen. So Kari, because you want to follow Jesus and walk in his footsteps, you make the most important decision of your life, going under the water, to say, Jesus, I want to follow you, be part of your people. God has a plan for your, your life, young man, a plan to unfold before you as you grow to serve Jesus now and forever. So we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, oh, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Let's stand and sing with Charles. When the roll is for the master to the center setting sun. Let us talk about his wondrous love and care. When all on life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, sing it I'll together. be there. When the roll is called of yonder, 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 I'll be there. Amen. Let's pray together. Bow our heads together. Is there somebody here tonight that you say, Jesus, there's just something in my life I need to surrender to you. I've come into this meeting and I've sensed the moving in the Spirit of God, but I know there's something in my life that's just not in harmony with your will. And I want to say, Jesus, I can't put off a decision. You may not be ready for baptism just yet, but you know in your heart God is stirring you. And there's something there that you need to surrender. I want to pray for you. Would you just raise your hand right now? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God, yeah, something that you have to surrender. Maybe an idea, maybe a concept, maybe a habit. And you just want to surrender that thing to Jesus just now. Is there somebody here that 
that once was baptized and you, you kind of drifted away, maybe like Donald, and you drifted pretty far away, but you indeed want to say, Jesus, I want to come back. I want to give my heart fully to you. In the future, I want to look forward to rebaptism. Would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you. God bless you. Many over here, some up in the balcony raising their hands, some in the center section, anybody in this section, you drifted, you want to come back, just raise your hand. Is there somebody here tonight that you want to look forward to Bible baptism? You haven't made that decision yet and you want to lift your hand, and just lift it up right now. God bless you. So many people making decisions for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Oh, my Father, our lives are in your hands. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, but we know the God of tomorrow. We know you care for us, and you know, we know you love us. Lead us, I pray thee, from here to all eternity. Help us never falter on the journey. Help us never fail on the journey. Send us from this place knowing that our hand is in the hand of God and that you're going to lead us home. And one day, even if we don't meet in this life, we want to meet in eternity. In Christ's name.